I think start giving you by a little bit history about my school life and where I came from and what sort of background that I had because I came from a very poor background. We never had a car in the family. We never, we were eight, four brothers and, uh, we have four brothers and four sisters. And out of all of these ones, I was the fifth born in a family of eight. So I was not very important to the family people. So <laughs> I had to repeat back my classes when my other seniors went to secondary school. I had to go back again a class behind in primary so that they could be able to get education and get out of school because back in the 60s, our fathers, as you know, they didn't have any jobs. They were just coffee farmers. And they didn't have enough money to be able to do anything that we really wanted to do. So I went back a class, two classes, so that I could allow my other two elder sisters to get out of, call out of secondary school. I mean, in the, in the, from form one to form four, and then I could be able to join and then carry on from there. But it was very good because the primary where we went in through are the days when we started learning the English medium. The English medium was something that was introduced because we used to have the local language. So we had to be able to come in and be able to speak English. When we started, being, started speaking English, I had uh, one of my big moments when we went in between standard one and standard three, and we didn't have much to be able to talk about because it was only mathematics and then English, few words, bad, good, no, yes. <laughs> so then we went to standard four. When we went to standard four, and now we started learning some grammar of English. I remember the teacher, she was a lady who said, how we put the big, bigger, biggest. And then she explained small, smaller, smallest. And then she came with the good. Then I rose up and said, good, gooder, goodest. <laughs> then I stood, no, 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 there's nothing, there's no story like that. <laughs> so we were so, you know, it's good, better, best. Then my friend who was sitting down on the other one, because we were changing the word, he was asked, how about bad? He stood, he said, bad, badder, baddest. He said, no, 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 it doesn't go like that. How does it go? I mean, it's bad, worse, and I mean, the situations, all of that. I mean, she can explain to you because at the end of the day, we used to be given what was called monitor. Monitor was somebody who was the last seen in the class of 40, having been the one to speak the local language in class. Instead, because if I caught you speaking the local language instead of English from standard four, I would hand you over the monto. So the last person to remain with the monto was known by everybody because that's the person who would be punished the next day in the morning. And thank God I never took the monto back with me home. Now, when we finished our primary, my real issue really, I wanted to become a priest. That was my real focus because I could see these priests, they were Italian priests in our church, who used to come to give us good, you know, stories and sermons and talking to all the congregation and then giving sacraments to all of us. And I, it was very good because we came from a very good religious, religion, uh, religious background. And as a result of where we were, we managed to become so good because we always feared God and we always respected each other and we always knew how to care for each other. What exactly mwalimu amesema hapa ni maneno ya kweli ile ambayo inajaribu kurudiwa sasa. Manake haya maneno tulikuwa tunakuwaga nayo zamani. That is those things we used to have them. But out of all that, something very interesting came up one day in 1969. We were in the local church sitting down there. And what used to be called the East, Afri the East African Safari Rally then came and passed through in front of the church, our church, and everybody left the church. We all left the church and went to watch, including the priest. We all left. <laughs> and we went to start watching these cars which were passing there. You know, Sasanda in the sub. Beyond Waldegard was still there those days. And of course, who? Simba Kenya. 
Joginda Singh. All of them, we were just getting in there. And that's where my first passion grew about rallying. So I got very interested in rallying, and after some time, I got into secondary school. And when I got into secondary school, I went down to Mombasa for my high school. When I was in Mombasa for high school, I met somebody who gave me some forms to fill on the scholarship to go to study in Japan. But I said, where is Japan? What happens with all of this? The only thing we know is karate movies. There wasn't much that we could be able to, to, to think about. But he said, no, it's a very developed country. It's actually one of the first world countries. That was now in 1976. So I said, ah, why not? I filled the form, and clearly, after some time, the scholarship came back. You can go down to Japan, go and do automobile engineering. I took it up. I went to Japan. And when I was there, I met the people who were doing, who were driving the Lancer, the Mitsubishi Lancers, now a car which had been driven by Joginda Singh. And as a result of that, when I left Japan after four years study, I came with a Colt Lancer back to Kenya. I bought a car only for 4,000 shillings. But then when I came back, I built the roll cage back here in Kenya. I built the roll cage and said, now I wanted to start doing the local rallies. So back in 1981, I started the local rallies. I started doing the local rallying. And it was very difficult because you found that these people who were there had better machines, they had better cars, and cars that were more powerful then it used to be either 2 liter or 1800cc or 1600cc, and then I had this 1400cc Lancer, which I was using. But what I learned was that determination is very important, and focus becomes the key point in all of this. We started in a very slow way, and at the end of it all, we learned how to finish the event. To learn to finish the rallies brought me a lot of good success. To cut a long story short, by 1984, I had managed now to be able to come with a Subaru. That's where my relationship started with the Subarus. And once I got involved with the Subarus, I got to now a four-wheel drive, 1600cc car, which could be able to drive very well in the mud. I ended up that year as the standard production champion for the first time that an African driver had done that. So that <laughs> began to bring now the success. I know most of you, as I met you there, everybody wants to hear the stories, but as we go in the next phase, now I can tell you the inside of moving from amateur to real professional driving, because the next phase is the one which created that. Once we became the standard production champion, 1986, we had the best chance now, after we had been given an 1800cc car by the Subaru team, and what was called now semi wax semi wax means you have been given a car exactly like the one which is being driven by the other professional drivers, but you have only been given limited tires and limited uh, spare parts and no service. Service, you have to do it yourself. So when we got into doing the service and getting ourselves to do this, we were lying something like 12th in the third leg, and my God, we hit the giraffe in Kisima. And then the whole story went so everywhere. How could you hit such a big animal, you know? <laughs> and couldn't you see? And, you know, you driving those days, the safari rally was 5,000 kilometers. And being 5,000 kilometers, you are driving day and night, and you are so tired. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, and it is so foggy and dusty. And you don't even, you think the road is going, it's just like the car is driving itself. But we just landed into this. I got some Italian guy who sold me as Italian geologist. He said, no, 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 you should have said a zebra. Zebra crossing is better. <laughs> the job is too big. But that, again, brought us something that we learned from it. Something that we learned from it and was so good because after that, the following year, we used the same car and finished the rally in the top 15 for the first time in 35 years where an African had not finished. <laughs> that was the beginning of our success because now we were given a Subaru Turbo 
1,800 cc turbo. And in the process of getting that, we managed now to get some good publicity, which was coming around. And this publicity earned us now the sponsorship from Marlboro for the first time. This sponsorship was so good because we got the locals for the local event and the safari rally. And from that day, we continued now with the finishing, coming in in the top 10 and finishing with Rick Matthews. I think that year we finished the eighth. Then the following year, 89, we finished 10th. Then come 1990, that was the biggest breakthrough because the World Championship introduced the FIA, introduced the Group N car to come to be in the rally. When the Group N was introduced, the first person to be chosen to come and drive in Group N as compared to Group A. Group A is the souped up car, much powerful, much stronger. But the Group N cars are the cars which are almost standard, only the tires and the suspensions you can change. So everything else was completely standard, apart from the roll cage, which is put in for the safety. But we drove so well, we worked so well, and finished sixth. By driving to sixth position and earning the World Group N championship points and getting the commercial for Subaru to be the first car to finish Group N in the World Championship, we hit the top league market. That made us fly all the way to Japan. We went, we signed a three-year contract now with the manufacturers, and then they said, from now on, you're going to be driving in the Group A car. So we got a Group A car for the local championship, won the group, the Kenya National Championship in 1990, overall, for the first time, and then we went on to drive in 19, yes, 93. 93, the Subaru's came said this. We want to change the legacy. The Subaru legacy is now out of the system. To change the Subaru legacy out of the system, we needed to bring the smallest car in the world. That was 600cc Vivio, a small Subaru. But we had to do 5,000 kilometers. And the worst frustration was being overtaken by everybody because the top speed in it was only 140 kilometers per hour while the other cars are doing 260, 240. So being overtaken, God just brought luck to us. Once it started raining going down to Mombasa in the Taita Hills, we were the fastest. Because being the small car, now we started overtaking everybody. <laughs> we were all going there. But it really became very good. And as a result of that, it really earned us very good challenge. And by 1984 now, we got back now to the Impressa, the Subaru Impressas. That's where now the real story started and the big, big sponsorships because 555 came in and uh, we went to drive with Colin McRae, Richard Burns. We all joined up in the same team in the World Rally Championship. And uh, from there, the rest, as you all know, most of the story you know from there. But to give you the inside stories which happens inside the car, there is a very big relationship between the driver and the co-driver. A lot of things happen inside there which you may not know because you are in a different world completely. You have a different system. The co-driver is here calling medium left 300, easy left 200, double caution, slow right, do not turn right. All that is space notes put in, read by the co-driver, is singing and you are dancing to the song. He's singing all that, and it's true because, like, when we are on the high seats, when we are on the speeds, which are like you, you grade the corner into six left one, left two, left three, left four, left five, left six. Left six being the fastest, left five being slightly not so fast, left four, you have to change a gear, left to three, you have to go two gears down, left to two, you have to go to second gear, left one is hairpin. So you have really to be in first gear. So once you learn that system, which comes again in translated into the other norm, is hairpin left or right, slow left or slow right, medium left or medium right, slow, uh, fast right or fast left, absolute left or absolute right, or maximum right or maximum left. You put all that into perception, and it becomes now the song that you have to sing. So that you, when you find the co-driver saying, is the left 600? Is the light 900? 900 is the distance. When it comes to the slow ones, it changes immediately. Uh, 300, double caution, slow right. 
200 million. You know danger is coming, so you slow down. But over these years, we have had big moments in 1995 when we were promised, we were told, okay, both of you, each of you, if you win the safari this year, each one of you gets a brand new Subaru on top of your bonus. And we said, the car of our choice? Yes, it was going to be factory made, custom made. And we said, okay, Rick, this is our turn. <laughs> we hold the steering. So we went so well by the first stage. I tell you, you can't believe it. We had three punctures. <laughs> so we fell back. By the time we were coming back to start leg two, we were something like number six. And now we wanted to fight back to come in. We had the biggest crash that has ever happened in the safari at Oletepesi behind the gong, driving at 220 kilometers with 200, with 100 liters of Afghas full because we had just been serviced and the car didn't explode. But I still can remember when we were rolling, people saying, Wamekufa hao. But we came out, we came out unscathed because the cage, the roll cage is so well built that you live to tell the stories as you sit down there. And all what happened out of it is that I learned something that I would want to share with you in a little while because I learned how to take responsibility to myself. When I asked my co driver, what happened? That was not a fast ride. He had turned two pages together. And instead of the double cushion, slow right into holes, it came as a fast right 800. So it was flat out because you have to believe him. And that's really, I took the whole responsibility. I went in front of the cameras and everybody. I said, no, it was my mistake. I, it's me. It's me. No, no, no. Everybody tried to dig the story. No, it's me. And that's why me standing here in front of you today, I would really want to share with you some things, some three points very important that I've learned from rallying which I use today. Number one is the back stops with me. Never, never, ever blame. Everybody else you hear the stories you hear, oh, you know, so and so did this. Oh, you know, we, the rains didn't come. Oh, you know this, who else? The president hasn't done this. You blame the government, you blame everybody. No one takes the responsibility. Take responsibility. It is very, very important. Over the years of learning going through those corners and getting so fast, I realized one thing. You had to be as straight as you can. You have to get out in a slow corner. You have to go out, try and see the apex, and drive as straight as if it is going straight because force travels on a straight line. So whether it is those corners, you try to be as straight as you can. In life today, if you are clear, it comes and it happens. They are the same things. The next one, and very important, ask the people who have more knowledge than you. Wisdom. Try and gain wisdom. Wisdom, you cannot learn it from any university. Just ask the people who know more than you. If you want to become a good tennis player, go and play with Serena, and you know you are, your level goes up. If the few ladies who wanted to know about the driving whom we were outside there with tea, if they want to come into there, you come down, then you see exactly all what happens in rallying and when you learn all the tricks because it's a really big, big, big responsibility. But above all of that is one thing that was so good that I really learned over the years of driving was how to make quick decisions. When you learn how to make decisions, because it's a fraction of a second and you're concluding, I was running past Kajiado in a place called Mashuru, 230 kilometers. On the bridge, cows are entering the same bridge that I'm trying to cross over. And all oh, what I did in a fraction of a second, we would have had a big crash on all those cars, just swung left light and pulled the handbrake, we went back again the same way we were doing. We did a 360 round. Once we did the 360, there was nobody who was hurt. We went slowly up to those cows, moved them out of the way, and crossed over. Why did that happen? Because I came to realize one thing. Successful people make their decisions quickly and change their minds slowly. Unsuccessful people make their decisions slowly and change their minds quickly. Let's be the ones to change our minds, to make our decisions quickly.